Okay, my friends, the lecture today is just a very bare minimum theoretical framework to deal with uh, uh, angular momentum in quantum theory. Well, we will start by introducing what is the classical uh, angular momentum and then try to see what is the analog in quantum theory. Finally, we are going to identify what is the eigenstates and eigenvalues of, the, of those angular momentum in quantum theory. Finally, we are going to give an example of the spin angular momentum and talk about Pauli matrices. This entire lecture is just a preparation for the addition of angular momentum, of two and three angular momentum, that we are, go that we are going to see in the le next lecture. So let's review. Let's just summarize the main ideas for the classical. So the classical angular momentum. How was it defined? Well, simply, you just define L, the vector L, as being the cross product of the position of your particle and the momentum of the particle. There are three components. You just take the cross product and you get the three components of the position and momentum. For example, the LZ component of this vector is essentially the position X times the momentum, the Y component of the momentum, minus the Y position times the momentum along the X direction. In this case, X and P are just numbers. So this is the cross product between numbers. Now, what is the analog? What is the analog of this thing in quantum theory? So in quantum theory, well, we start with this thing and you convert each one of these variables into operators. So in this case, the x position, which is a number in classical mechanics, is transformed into the x operator, the same thing for y and for z. You do the same thing for the momentum, so p, let me write it first. So x, at the r operator, essentially the idea is that the r here, which uh, whose entries are numbers, now is converted into, let's call it big R, at, which is a vector whose entries are these three operators, so the x, the y, and the z operators. In an analogous way, we are going to convert the p, which is a vector with three entries, which are numbers, and you're going to convert them, well, the px, py, and pz give the, the are substituted by the uh, momentum operators and you get big P, which now is a vector whose entries are operators. So this is how you proceed to convert this vector quantity into the following vector quantity in quantum theory. So big R cross with P. In particular, the third component of this uh, vector is going to be LZ. It's almost this. So it's X, big X, PY, hat, minus big Y, PZ. Can you see? Here it's PX. Okay? The PX that you find here. So, this is how you convert from a classical uh, uh, definition into a quantum definition here. And you could also identify the other components for the, L, uh, the operator Lx and Ly. But you see, from these, so uh, the now let's introduce a very important idea. Knowing these and knowing the canonical commutation relations, so the fact that x big X, Px, is equal to 1 h bar, i h bar, and the same thing for y, p of y, is equal to i h bar, and the same thing for z, 
dz is equal to i h bar. So from these relations that we started with, and knowing these definitions, we can derive, we won't do it in this lecture because it's, this is just a summary of the ideas, but you can derive after calculations the commutation relations between the components of this vector. Namely, you can see, you can prove that Lx, Ly, is equal to ih bar here Lz. You can prove that Ly Lz is equal to 1 ih bar Lx. And finally, you can also prove that Lz Lx is equal to i h bar l y. You can almost see they cycle. You see, you start with this one, and then this go goes to this position. This goes into this position, and that goes into this position. You get this, and do the same thing. This goes into this position, that goes into this position, and this one goes into there. So it's cyclic. So it's a nice way to remember these commutation relations. So all of that is a consequence of these and these definitions. We can prove this. Moreover, you can also define, you see, if you have this L vector, you can also define its norm. So let's, let's define the norm. So the L at squared. By the way, after a while, because uh, from now on we will just focus on quantum theory, I'm going, I'm going to suppress the at because we are, for now on, we are going to abandon the classical ones, so there is no risk of, of confusion. So instead, I'm going to just write L vector squared. Of course, this, by definition, is the P x squared. I'm sorry, it's the L. L x squared. L y squared plus L z squared. Of course, these are operators. I'm going to suppress the adds from now on. Moreover, knowing this definition and knowing this, you can also prove something extremely important, which is L squared will commute with all the three components. So either Lx is equal to 0, or if you have Y or Z here. So this is our starting point. So from classical theory, you convert into quantum theory. You derive these commutation relations from this, this, the starting point. But now, these commutation relations are very important. So, here's, here is what we can say. This angular momentum that you find here, this operator, well, you can either say, like, say it like this. Well, it's defined as being this cross product. But another way to think about it about the angular moment is to say, well, uh, the, this angular moment satisfies these equations. Can you see? This is important because in quantum theory, we want to talk about angular momentum that are more general than this specific definition. In particular, this definition would be good to, for example, describe the orbital angular momentum of an electron around the nucleus. But it, it no is no longer good to, for example, to de define the intrinsic angular momentum, the spin angular momentum of an electron, for example. So to describe those types of angular momentum, you need a more general definition of angular momentum. And that general definition I'm going to give you now, because is essentially, you see, all angular momentum in quantum theory satisfies commutation relations like this. So I'm going to erase these L's and replace them by J's, the ger gen a general angular momentum here. So what we, what we find now instead is that J, JY, JY, JZ, this is J's, are the general angular momentum. In particular, one example of such angular momentum is this, this definition, but I want you to focus on the general. This J can be many things. It can be this L, or it can be the spin angular momentum. What we know about J, well, we know that it satisfies these rules. It, it does not necessarily have to take the form given by this. Okay? So this is general. And this is our starting point for what we are about to see next. 
So let me erase this, because uh, you only need, this is our starting point. And let's make a key observation regarding these commutation relations. First of all, the j's are observables. So the j is an observable. J is the vector j whose entries is jx, jy, and gz is an observable. Because of that, we can find a set of eigenstates which are, are perpendicular, so orthogonal to each other. So you can find a, a set of eigenstates which are orthogonal to each other, and they form a basis. They form a basis for the, the space for the space we are in. You see? Moreover, the eigenvalues are real. Okay? This is a consequence of the fact that it's uh, not observable. Specifically, to be unobservable, it means that the, the, the components of this vector is emission. So, if you take, for example, the JZ component, if you take the emission conjugate, well, it gives it give us the same operator. So, from this, you can conclude that you can find an eigen, uh, eigenstates which are perpendicular, and they form a basis for our state space. So, the space that we are about to use to describe this generic angular momentum. So far, so good. But now let's focus on what we, on the consequence on the, on the consequences of these commutation relations, because you see, we know that j squared and j z, for example, let's focus on those commute. This is a as a this has a very profound consequence. So the fact that j squared and j z is equal to zero means we can find and thus define, so define as well, a set of uh, eigenstates, so let me write it by a set of cats, a set of cats, which are eigenvectors, of both, of both operators. This is what, it, what this thing is supposed to mean. If they commute, you can find those sets of eigenstates. And w in what we are about to see, well, you're going to define those states and, uh, and see what, uh, what they look like. Moreover, you can, f you, you see, you need to combine these two ideas now, because you can find that set of eigenstates which are common to both, but since these are observables, that set of uh, eigenstates can be made perpendicular, and moreover, they can span the entire space of states. Okay? I mean, of course, the eigenvalues of both are positive. So, let's just put this idea uh, up front. What is our goal now? Our goal now is to define exactly the eigenstates of these two cats. But why do we want to do that? Well, you see, in general, see, here's the problem that we want, to, that in general we want to solve. You want to find the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian of your system. So you start with h, and you want the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this thing. But if you know, if you know that h commutes with j squared and jz, then that means that we can find a set of states which are eigenvectors of h, j squared and jz. Very important. You want to find the eigenvectors and, uh, eigenva and eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But if they commute, they can maybe be common to j squared and jz. So the idea now is that if you already know, 
if you already know the eigenvectors of j squared and jz, that makes it easier to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of h. This is the idea. In this lecture, we are going just to focus on what, uh, what is the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this thing. And I'm, no, I'm not going to prove it, I'm going just to state the idea, but knowing this, and knowing something else that I'm about to say, determines the, eigen the, the eigenvalues and, and eigenvectors. So what is the other thing that I still need to specify? Well, I need to specify what's called the ladder operators. So the ladder, let's put it in red. The ladder operators. The J plus, which is by definition Jx plus I, Jy, and J minus. These ladder operators, well, you can derive further commutation relations from these and these. And through this definition and all of these commutation relations, you can prove the final very important conclusion. So I'm going to just to skip the details of it and write. You see, because those things not only allow us to define the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, they help us organize them. So this is our goal from now on, to give the final conclusion of this thing. Further, the, the commutation relations that we could have derived between these and each one at the jx, jy, gz, and j, uh, and j squared. So let's see. The final conclusion of, of those things written there is essentially that j squared the, eigen the eigenvectors of j squared and eigenvalues are defined by j m is equal to j j plus 1 h bar squared j m. The eigenvector here and the eigenvalue here. I'm going to say soon what the j is. So, but first, let me just uh, say what uh, the because this cat here is also an eigenvector of j z. So you have this. And the eigenvalue is m h bar j m here. So far, so good. What are those j and m? Well, j and m are what's called quantum numbers. Specifying those quantum numbers determines the eigenvalues. So it's just a, a, a useful way of rewriting the eigenvalues. In particular, from these relations, and the commutation relation that you can further derive with the ladder operators. We know that j only takes some special values, namely 0, 1 half, 1, 3 half, and so on. So either integers or integers divided by 2. These are the values for j. Moreover, you can also prove that m takes on also special values, namely, every single time you specify a j, the m must be between minus j and plus j. These are the rules, the old final consequence, consequence of these things, is that. So you can have, so you just j squared and jz, they commute, it's, it's there, j squared, jz is equal to zero, means that you can find an, a set of s cats which are eigenstates of both operators. Here are the corresponding eigenvalues. You can find that set of uh, common eigenstates. And now what we can do is to label those eigenstates, those common eigenstates, by the eigenvalues. You could label this eigenstate by this one, the eigenvalue, and by that eigenvalue. But because that's too much work to do, because it's a complicated formula, you just use the J. The J essentially is a label, is a label for the eigenvalue, and like the M is, and it's also being used as a label for the cat here, the eigenstate. You could in principle, you could in principle, if you did knew better, for example, this is the, uh, let's call it lambda, lambda, 
one, and this is a lambda two. You could, in principle, define, inf instead of Jm, you could write lambda one, lambda two. As for the eigenstates, you just label the eigenstates by the eigenvalues, like that. But because we know from this that those eigenvalues have this specific form, we go one step further, in, instead of writing some complicated number here, you just write the index that determines that number. In specifically, you use j and m. So the idea is that every single time operators commute, you can find a set of common eigenvectors, you can label them through the eigenvalues, but if those eigenvalues are in turn determined by some specific index, well, ju you just use the index to, re uh, to label the, eigen uh, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, not the actual eigenvalues. This is too complicated. This is much easier. So, notice one more idea. Notice also. We just labeled the eigenvectors. I did not say what they actually are. So far, the only thing that we know is that they can be made, that they are orthogonal, if the quantum numbers are different. Okay? So, uh, so far we have these rules. So now I'm going to make a picture that organizes them based on this information, because this is, ju this is just too complicated. So let me just organize it into a very easy picture to di digest. So, let me write here on the horizontal axis the m values and on the vertical axis the j values. If j is equal to zero, then m is between zero and zero, meaning m is zero. So we are here. m is equal to zero and j is equal to zero. So far, so good. If j is equal to one f, m is between minus 1f and plus 1f. Of course, I forgot to tell you that is in steps of 1. So the m is all values between minus j and plus j in steps of 1, not every possible uh, value. So the m, if j is equal to 1f, so you get m is equal to minus 1f or m is equal to plus 1f, because minus 1f and plus 1f, well, is separated by a step of 1. So let me write it here. So minus 1f plus 1f, 1f here, and you have these two dots here on this graph. Let's, let's, let's do one, uh, two more. So when j is equal to 1, so m is between minus 1 and 1, so m is either minus 1, 0, or, or, or 1. Let me put it minus 1, here a 1, so we can either be, so this is 1, so it's either mi minus 1, 1, 0, 1, or 1, 1. Can you see? One final example, if j is 3 m three f, then you can now m immediately say, see, it is minus 3 f plus 3 f. You can either have here the three f's, and you can have here this, 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 and that. Can you see? Separated by one. Separated by one. Separated by one. Can you see? Just like I told you. What does it mean, each one of these dots, if, if it's not already obvious? Well, each one of these dots, for example, this one, is just a uh, geometrical representation of a state like this. So this is j, 3f's, and m, 3f's. So what you see here are the cats, the eigenstates of these two operators. By the way, it's also a basis for your state space, okay? So the basis is these elements. Of course, you can keep on going with this because the diagram does not end at j 3 f You can uh, go forever with it. So the basis is essentially infinite, infinite dimensional, uh, it's an infinite dimen dimensional uh, uh, space. 
No, let's look at the picture, because there are certain uh, key observations that we can make for it. For example, let's name the space spanned by this cat, which is the zero zero cat, as being E j is equal to zero. It's a one-dimensional space. It's like having a vector, the zero zero vector, and now you can multiply them, multi multiply, multiply it by some uh, complex number. So it's, it moves along a one uh, a line, essentially. Here we find a two-dimensional dim subspace of our state space. The E j is equal to 1 f. Above it, we find the E j is equal to 1. And finally, here, we find the E j is equal to 3 f. One-dimensional, two-dimensional space, because it's span uh, it's spent by uh, uh, because it is uh, results from the linear uh, all the possible linear combinations between these two eigenstates, which by the way are orthogonal because the quantum numbers are different. This is a three-dimensional uh, uh, space, and this is four-dimensional, and so on. These subspaces will be important for later, and because they show us something. Notice. I did not tell you yet what is the j, the ladder operators. Let's me, let me define them right now. Let me define, define them. Because they have a very nice interpretation in this picture. So if you act with j plus or minus in a, sta in a cat, j on the basis cat, jm, you are going to get some constant times j M and if you apply the up the, the 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 up operator, then you get plus one. You increase m by one. If you uh, uh, apply the minus operator here, you get here a minus. So essentially, the j is either increases the m by one or decreases by one. So what is the constant here? The constant is just a complicated mess of the square root of j j plus one minus m, m plus or minus 1. This is essentially the constant. Yet we have to compute every single time you act with j on it. But you see, you start with the jm, you act with the, the, the big j, plus or minus, and you get a new cat, which is increased by, uh, uh, where the m is increased or decreased by 1. From the pictorial uh, perspective, what, what does it mean? Well, if you start with this state, the three f's, three f's, you act, for example, with j minus, it increases m by one. So instead of three f's, you get three f's minus one, which is one f. So essentially, the j minus maps this basis cat into that one, times a constant. If you act again with the j minus on this one, you can see the picture now. If you would act with j minus again here, you will get zero. But now you can go the other way and act with j plus, and j, pl uh, j plus, and so on. These are the ladder operators. Can you see? They convert one of the basis cats of the e j three f's, three uh, f's. They map them. They connect them. And, you are, and uh, the action of J is all, always stuck in this subspace here. The same for the others. Okay? So is, this is essentially the idea of, uh, 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 of, again, of these eigenstates and these uh, uh, J plus or minus. All of these consequences of this. I'm not going into the details. You can find it on the books uh, uh, how to prove those things. This is uh, just the main idea, the summary of what you need to know. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, we have this structure, essentially. All these vectors are orthogonal to each other. They are uh, 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 normal as well. And that's all we know so far about them. Now, 
let me get, just give a specific example, a specific example of uh, a system with a, uh, an electron in it. If you have a system with an electron, and you want to describe, you want to describe the the spin states of that electron. Well, the spin states of that electron are essentially represented by cats, which live in some space of states. But what is the space of states that describe the spin of a, an electron? Well, I'm going to tell you what right now what is the answer. The answer is the E j is equal to 1 f, that space which is results from a linear combination of this cat with this cat. So it's a two-dimensional space, like a plane. Any cat in that space, in that plane, in quotes, can uh, describes describes the spin state of an electron. So the spin states of an electron live in this layer here. So, in particular, so we are from now on, for this example, let's adopt that j is equal to one f. If you adopt j is equal to one f, these formulas all of a sudden become much easier to 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 work with. So this is one f. This is one f now. Here as well, of course. This is one f. This is one f. Of course, one f times one f plus one is equal to three fourths. So this is three fourths h bar squared. And the m, well, the m is either plus or minus one f. Let's now introduce uh, uh, some special notation to dealing with the spin of an electron, because we are now working just with e j is equal to one f. So we are going to define some new letters for it. First of all, instead of a j, we said generic angular momentum. We want to speak about the angular momentum of uh, uh, the intrinsic angular momentum of an electron, and for that, we instead of j, let's write s. This is the first modification. Yes. Instead of M, we could write, for example, MS here. To remember that it is the spin. The, the, the MS here determines the spin, the Z component of the intrinsic spin of the electron. Moreover, because we already know that we are exclusively working win within this subspace, well, j is always equal to 1f, so there is no need to remind me of that fact. So let me suppress this quantum number from the cat. So ms is equal to plus or minus 1. I can go one step further. Instead of writing all the time whether ms is plus or minus 1f, because 1f might be a complicated symbol to write, you can write instead you can write instead, uh, you can replace this thing by the sign. You can replace it by the sign. So you can either write, instead of the ms state, you can write instead m sigma, where sigma is either plus or minus. You replace this symbol by that symbol, where sigma is either plus or minus. You, if you prefer, you can, instead of, instead of plus or minus, you can also adopt the notation with the a plus means up, and minus means down. Okay? So you can see that we move from the general definition of angular momentum, and now you just have this very uh, uh, special notation, which is usually what we find on books. Because on books, uh, uh, everything is, is already uh, suppressed, and you need to understand from the context what this thing is supposed to mean. Okay? So, the original cat, of course, you need to specify j and m, but we won't, don't want to write j and m all the time. So we just simplify notation and write the cat, ms, with a plus or minus, with a minus or plus or minus 1f, or, or with the sigma, plus or minus, or just up or down. Okay? So let me just give an example of it. Let me just give an example. Uh, I want to keep this. I want to keep this 
for what we are about to see. Uh, so I need to suppress, maybe I'm going to suppress it, to erase this part here. To erase this part and this part as well. I just want our spin states because what I want to, to show you now is the what, uh, uh, what are the eigenstates here. So for example, because you see, these are operators, operator acting on cats. I want now to see uh, the matrix representations of these operators. So let's do it here. This is not good. So, what do we know? We know this. SZ, the operator, can act, for example, on, let me write it, plus 1F. I'm going to keep the 1F notation from now, uh, because this is, uh, uh, because it's going to be easy to make the calculations, but after you have some training with it, you can just replace it by up or down arrows. So I'm going to keep this one. So the M is 1F. So SZ is acting on one of these eigenstates. So we get H bar divided by 2 plus 1F. Can you see? If, if it is instead acts on the minus 1F, you will get minus H bar divided by 2 minus 1F. So far, so good. This is just a particular case of this general formula. But you see, let me rewrite this in a, another way. Because when SZ acts on a cat, well, it transforms it into another cat. But that cat lives in E, J is equal to 1F. So it must be a linear combination of both. Here is the linear combination of, of both. What's not written here, and which is I'm about to write, is that we have 0 times this cat. So plus 0 times the minus 1f here. Can you see? So when I write this thing, what I'm in fact meaning is that you have this positive number times the cat ms and plus 0 from the remaining ones. In this case, the remaining one, well, it's minus 1f here. Of course, in this case, you have minus 0, the plus 1f. Let me just switch the order, because I wanted to see something. So it's 0 plus 1f minus h bar divided by 2 minus 1f. So far, so good. Th I just rewrote what's written here, but in a more complete manner. What does it mean, this thing here? Can you see? Because from this, wha from what you see here, I can now introduce the following numbers. So for example, I can introduce the 1f as z, 1f. You act with the bra on this thing, so act with the bra on this thing, so it gets, it gets 1. You act the bra with the bra on this thing and you get 0. So this thing is just h bar divided by 2. You can do uh, uh, you can do it with a minus as well. And you get 0 again because this one acting on that one, this thing acting on this thing is, is going to give a 0. This thing acting on this thing is going to give you 1 because they are the same state, but it's multiplied by 0, so you get 0 again. Moreover, 1f SZ minus 1F, you get 0 again because this thing acting on that is going to be 1, but it's times 0. This one at acting on, it one on that one, but they are orthogonal, so it's going to be 0. And finally, we get minus 1F, SZ minus 1F, which uh, is, a, uh, is going to give us minus H bar divided by 2. So from these definitions, you can compute these formulas, these numbers here. But those numbers now can be organized, can be organized as follows. 
in a square in a matrix, and this entry is this entry. This entry is this entry. This entry is this entry, and this entry is that one, the last one. So what I found, what we just found from this, meaning from this, is the matrix representation of a the operator S Z in its in its eigenbasis. Remember, the cat M S is an eigenstate of S Z, so the B the basis that we are considered for this E j is equal to an F subspace, so that's those two dots are the plus one F plus one F or minus one F cat. This is the basis of eigenstates of S Z. And of course, when you write an operator in its eigenbasis, of course the matrix is diagonal. Moreover, I can rewrite this thing now. You can I can rewrite it and put uh, and put the the h bar divided by 2, like this, and get 1 minus 1, 0 and 0. And now define, define what you see here as a Pauli matrix. See, Pauli matrix. It's the Pauli matrix assigned to this operator SZ. Well, I can now represent the S, uh, X and SZ operators, by the way the x, s, x, and s, z. Uh, but before going uh, uh, into that, wha wha let's go into that right now. Let's go into that. I see we have something to say about this. Uh, but I think it's obvious. Let me first say it before I go into uh, s, x, and x, y. Because these states here, the, these operators, essentially are going to map this one into this one and that one into that one. I'm going to just show you an, an example. So J plus, acting on this, I'm, going, I'm suppressing the J, by the way, notice it, you get H bar, square root, 1F, 1F plus 1, this is the 1F that I suppressed in the cat, minus, minus 1F, so it's plus 1F, here is 1f, minus 1f, and then because I'm doing a plus, it's a plus here, and you get the uh, uh, minus 1f plus 1. Now you can just compute this number, and you get here, of course, minus 1f plus, plus 1 is essentially plus 1f. So we just saw rigorously when jx J, when J plus acts on this one, on this cat here, it transforms it into this cat here, times some constant, okay, that you can compute. Now, what happens if I act with Jx again on the plus 1f state? Let's see. This is a non-zero number, by the way, but this one, so it's 1f, 1f plus 1. Let's compute the numbers. Uh, uh, minus 1f, 1f plus 1. I hope you can see it. Would be 1f plus 1 here. But you see, that number and that number are 0. So this is essentially 0. So wh when you act with jx on that cat, you get 0. So there is no further uh, basis cats for this subspace here. Okay? This is the idea that I wanted to show you about the J plus or minus, because now I want to s you to see what are the matrices for S, X, and S, Y. So let's do it. Let's do it here. Carefully. Let's I think this is enough. So before I'm going to that, well, we have S, X, and S, Y. We want to construct their uh, matrices. Well, you see, we did not define how Sx acts on the basis, the eigenbasis, of Sz. I don't know how Sx acts on that. I did not define it. However, I did define something that helps me 
to, uh, dic to, uh, to say how this Sx acts on this basis. See, when you... So, wait one step at a time. Remember, we have j plus or minus is equal to jx plus or minus i j y. Now you can invert this uh, uh, system of operators and write, well, jx, so you just sum the two. If, you're not see if you don't see it, let me just write it like this. J my is jx minus i j y. It's probably easier to see it like this. If you sum these two equations, this term cancels with that one because this is a plus, this is a minus. So you get 2jx here. Can you see? So you have 2jx equals to j, uh, j plus plus j minus. So that means that jx is equal to 1f j minus plus j plus. If we subtract from this equation from that equation, these two cancel, but this is this one minus this one, but is the minus cancel, so you get 2i jy is equal to j plus minus j minus. So you get j y is equal to 1 over i2 j plus minus j minus. Let me just invert here. So we do not know how, how, j, uh, how the, the j's act on the basis of jz. We don't, do not know, but we do know how j plus or minus act. And we just rewritten j, x, and j, y in terms of the ladder operators. Of course, what's true for j is, equal to f is, is true for s. So instead of j, I could put here an s. And I can now act with s, x, acting see, I want a matrix for S, X, but what is a matrix of an operator? Well, you can get the matrix for an operator by n specifying how that operator acts on some basis. This is what we did here. We specified how S, A, S, Z acts on the basis that we chose. It, it, it gives us that, but this in turn allows us to define this. Now we want to do something similar. We want to know how Sx acts on the basis cats here. And from that, derive the matrix representation. But Sx is equal to 1f s plus plus s minus. So when you act on uh, uh, some cat, uh, let's call it plus 1f here is equal to 1f j plus plus j minus acting on the plus here. Let me put here s, s plus and s minus. Now let's act with each one. Well, s plus act acting on plus 1f is equal to 0 just as we, sh as we showed here. So we just get 1f times some constant. I have to compute it minus 1f. Can you see? Acting on that, this is only survivor. So, what you see here, no, you, you just have to compute the constant, by the way. You have to compute the constant here. And I think, you, I don't know if you can see the constant. Because it is the same, it's the same constant as this one, by the way. Because you get, uh, let me write it. It's probably easier to write it downstairs. So what you get here is, uh, I want to, to see this, at least one example of it. I want, to want to, I want to just see it. So you get here the j, so it's 1f, 1f plus 1 from here, minus, now 1f, so it's 1f, and you get here 1f minus 1, it's a minus because you are acting with S minus. The S plus kills it, gives zero. And you get here the minus 1F. Let me erase this thing here. Now let's compute the number that you find here. So from here, you get 1F 
plus 1, so 1f one uh, uh, is 3f, times 1f is 3 fourths, right? Minus, so it is 1f minus 1, which is minus 1f, minus 1f times, times minus 1f is plus 1 fourth, and 3 fourths plus 1 fourth is equal to 1. So this entire thing is in fact 1. So it's a 1, so I'm going to put it like this. Can you see? This is quite easy. By the way, let's do the other... By the way, let's com just complete plus 0, plus 1f, like this. The, the other one, by the way. Can you see? Uh, uh, n n uh, I'm sorry, not the, uh, not the other one. So s plus, let me just make it clear. S plus acts on this, it would get 1f plus 1, but the coefficient would be 0, just like we showed here. This 0 times uh, 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 the cat plus 1f is just from the fact that when we act with Sx on the, the basis cat, you get some weighted combination here. Okay? So, you find that. Moreover, if we have Sx minus 1f, you will get, well, I'm going to do the calculation in one shot because it's 0 minus 1f plus h bar plus 1f. And from this alone, you can now derive the, the, those four numbers. We can derive from here. You can derive, what can you derive? You can derive this. Sx on the basis of eigenstates of Sz, because we are working in that basis, those cats are the basis cats of Sz. We know now how Sx acts on that basis. Well, when Sx acts on these basic elements, you know, on this basis element, gives us this linear combination. When Sx acts on the second basis elements, it gives us this linear combination. But that in turn, those numbers, those coefficients here, 0, h, by the way, it's h, there is a 1f missing here. So these numbers, h bar divided by 2, 0, and h bar divided by 2, 0, can be organized in the following matrix. So it's 1, 1, 0, 0. Can you see? d0 is d0. This uh, h bar divided by, uh, by 2 is that one. d0 is that 0. This h bar divided by 2 is that one. And of, co of course, this is a, another Pauli matrix. Finally, to conclude this lecture, I'm not going to do the details. I'm going to tell you the answer. I'm going to tell you just the answer. The representation of the SY operator in the basis of eigenstates of Sz and S squared, by the way, I forgot about that. So these two variables commute, so the eigenstates are common to both. Well, you follow a similar plan because you have here Sy. Our Sy is defined in terms of uh, those ladder operators. And we would find this. Minus i, i, 0 and 0 here. Okay? So, these are just the summary of the basic ideas without the proofs. I didn't without the proofs that connect our commutation relations with uh, what we just found, especially with that picture. These are the just the basic, uh, uh, the basic summary that of we need for describing one angular momentum. And now what the, the goal now from the next, le or next lecture is going to be how to add angular momentum. Of course, on that lecture, we are going to start already with these ideas in mind. So, and by the way, after adding two, let's see how to add three angular momentum. So let's see, let's see how this, the, how that thing uh, is going to be. And uh, now, let's go to work. Just review these things. Go to work, and uh, uh, and let's see next lecture. See you next time.